Welcome to another episode of Divorce TV. And today we have expert Lorraine Toll, who is a collaborative lawyer in a pre-recorded interview. We have a shared story from Elizabeth Goddard and healing with our own Susan Cal Miller. So first, let's get on with the news. Uh, first story today, it's not strictly divorce, but it is related to uh, family law. Um, it's about can an adult child seek maintenance from their parents? So Vicky Rawlins in Family Law Nexus Lexis writes, um, sorry, Lexis Nexus writes that there have recently been two cases in which adult children have begun court proceedings seeking a formal court order to force their parents into providing ongoing financial support to them. The first was reported from Italy in August and involved a 35-year-old man applying to top up his wages earned as a part-time music teacher from his parents. Amazingly, a lower court has found that his parents should provide him with a monthly stipend as his wages were not enough for him to live on. The Supreme Court in Italy reversed the decision and ruled that parents are not financially responsible for their children for life. God. Now, in a similar case this year, the English courts have been asked to consider the same issue. This time, the applicant was 41 years old. He is a qualified solicitor, holding a degree in modern history, a master's degree in taxation, and presently studying for chartered tax advisory exams. He has, however, been unemployed since 2011 and suffers from various mental health difficulties. He was living in a flat in London which was paid for by his parents, who lived in Dubai. Very nice. The application apparently arose following a falling out between son and parents, which led to the parents limiting the financial assistance paid. So this application was for maintenance and the court considered the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973, the Children Act 1989, Human Rights Act 1999 and the court's inherent jurisdiction. The decision was given by Sir James Mumby, who described the application as most unusual and unprecedented. The application was summar summar I knew I'd get this wrong, summarily dismissed and the applicant ordered to pay his parents' legal costs. The applicant sought permission to appeal, but this was refused. So whilst perhaps both of these cases have been referred to quite frivolously, frivolously, writes Vicky, with the outcomes being considered obvious, they do of course involve real families, real disputes and no doubt real heartache. She says, I wonder what the future will hold for these families following these applications. Hopefully some form of reconciliation will prove possible. What do you think? Is that likely? Next story. Divorces in England and Wales see highest percentage increase in 50 years. Uh, this is according to um, Sky News, but from the Office of National Statistic Figures. Adultery, it claims, is the most common reason for divorce among opposite and same-sex couples, according to the ONS. Well, that didn't quite make sense to me, so I had a little look. And of course, it's not really not really true. Uh, they include apparently adulter adultery in their stats for unreasonable behaviour. So it's unreasonable behaviour that is the most common, not adultery per se, because it's the most sensible one to go for um, if you're forced to play the blame game, which hopefully we won't have to do anymore in the UK from next autumn. It goes on to say that the number of divorces in England and Wales has seen the largest a percentage increase in nearly 50 years, according to new research. Data from the Office for National Statistics shows that divorces among heterosexual couples rose by 18.4% last year. This is the highest rise since 2014, when 111,169 divorces were granted in England and Wales. It was also the largest annual percentage increase in the number of divorces since 1972 following the Divorce Reform Act 1969, which made it easier for couples to divorce upon separation, the ONS has said. The ONS said, said that these increases can be partially due to there being a backlog of casework in 2018, which would have resulted in a higher number of separations last year. So in other words, they're playing catch up, so that probably accounted for a lot of it. And the other thing that isn't explained but I think it's fair to say is that when a divorce is granted then we get those stats but the fact is most of those divorces started 
several years before. Um, so what we really need is the data for the number of petitions, the divorces that are beginning, so we can get a sense of the trend. But I'm afraid you'll have to, have to wait for December to get the July to September figures for that, I'm afraid. Uh, last week, you may remember that we, um, we talked about the US, which indicated a reduction in divorce. Um, and of course, with the recession, that's even more likely. And I, I have to say, I do I do suspect that that's what will be the case here. But the key thing is, who cares about the stats? Let's focus on how we divorce, um, not how many people are doing it, because let's face it, that's what we should be really looking at here. And our last story, we've got the Mail Online talking that, saying that lesbian couples are twice as likely to divorce as married gay men, ONS data reveals, as overall rates see largest rise in 50 years. Obviously, that's the rise of all divorces because you haven't been able to have gay marriage for 50 years. Of those same-sex couples who divorced last year, 589, that's 72%, took place between women. There were 233 between men. The figures are a stark rise, they say, on 2018, when there were 321 same-sex divorces between women and 107 between men. The ONS said that the number of same-sex divorces has increased each year to reflecting the increasing size of the same-sex married population since the introduction of marriages of same-sex couples in March 2014. So yes, they may sound like exciting statistics, but actually it would go up as you're getting more and more people getting married. Um, I thought I'd just get a little bit uh, more information on this to uh, balance out the, the Daily Mail. And we've got Pink News, which reports that, and uh, this was interesting, looking at statistics for opposite sex couples could also provide an explanation as overall, and this is why more women seem to be getting divorced, uh, uh, lesbian women rather than gay men, as overall women are much more likely to instigate divorce proceedings than men with two-thirds initiated by women in the last 10 years. While it has been widely reported that divorces among same-sex couples have increased year on year since the legalisation of marriage equality in the UK, the ONS explained that this only reflects the increase in the number of LGBT plus couples getting married. Now, we're going to have our expert. It's a short interview with Lorraine Toll and settle down and find out a little bit more about how successful collaborative law can be. If parties are finding it difficult to agree how to resolve their disputes, we must remember it's okay to not agree. It's okay to do that. Um, what we have to do is try to work out what is the best course of action for each party. And that's not always going to be the same route for everybody. The difference between collaborative law and mediation, um, on the face of it, there's not a great deal of difference. With collaborative law, we use the same process, but you each have your own lawyer, you each have your own expert in the room, which often makes people feel more comfortable because they feel that they've got somebody on their side with them. I think the key difference between mediation and collaborative law, however, is that we sign up uh, to a participation agreement and that really gives the commitment to yourself, to the, to the other parties and to the legal experts that you are committed to using this process. And actually, it's quite nice to hear your spouse, your, your ex-partner, to understand what they want to achieve out of the process and then in turn they they understand what you want to achieve also there's several ways in trying to resolve matters collaborative law is just one of them if at our initial meeting you decide that collaborative law is the option that you would like to take the first port of call would be for us to contact the other party that could be a phone call to the solicitor if they already have solicitors engaged or to the person directly and we would explain to them that you would like to choose the collaborative law process, we can send them some information about what that process is and see if they would be willing to try it. Collaborative law could be useful for everybody. Um, I would particularly recommend it where parties, where there is a degree of um, amicableness, where there is a degree of um, willing to try to cooperate with each other, where there is a degree of compromise. And actually where matters where people are still on talking terms and feel that they really can try to resolve matters between them. Um, having a collaborative law process model in place just helps parties to guide them through the process, um, but at the same time giving them their legal advice. 
Collaborative law could potentially be a lot less than going to court. On average, we would say that for three or four court hearings, you could cost it could cost you in the region of twenty-five to thirty thousand pounds plus VAT each, plus you've got disbursements such as barrister fees. To have three or four collaborative meetings, which on average is is the, the number that we would have within a process to complete, you would pay far less than that. Thank you, Lorraine. Brilliant stuff. And she's been really successful with uh, using collaborative law and it's definitely something you should check out. Um, it's one of the wonderful options that are available to you. Now we're going to have a quick update through our QR masterclass here. We've got the QR code and it's um, we're going to be looking at arbitration. So a uh, QR code there will take you to the course. Next week, it will be taking you to the app because that's going to be launched. I promise I'm going to make it happen over the weekend. So just briefly, I wanted to finish off this little bit about set sale, setting sale on your divorce. You want to have an intelligent approach and that means you know what your options are. Uh, family arbitration is uh, it's just so useful and yet so many people don't really consider it properly. Now, Private judge, that's what a family arbitrator is. And you might be saying, well, how can that be cheaper than uh, you know going to court? But of course, you don't have to involve all the other people that are in the court. Um, you can, some depends on how complex it is. It might be, a, you may be talking a few hundred, not a few thousand pounds. So definitely worth checking out if you really can't decide and choose yourselves what the outcome is. And you might have tried mediate, be had some success with mediation or with collaborative law but maybe there's something you're stuck on and this was told to me by a, a mediator Ken Newman who's very um, uh, very experienced mediator in New York and he said he quite often uh, if they get stuck in a mediation will say to a couple do you want someone else to decide for you and a lot of people think that means you have to then go to court whereupon they don't pay much attention to all the things that you've already agreed on. It's kind of like unraveling a ball of string. So it's definitely not where you want to be. So bringing in your own private judge keeps you in control because you together as a couple, you choose who you're going to use and you choose a, 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 a someone who may have been a, a barrister uh, that will always have had a, a long, a good history of, of um, legal training. They're very experienced. You can't just... Um, qualify as a lawyer and then go straight to be an arbitrator and they may be even be an ex-judge and that person is especially you choose a specialist so you might be looking at finances you choose a, a specialist in finances you don't know you're going to get that with a judge in the family court you may have children matter so you get an arbitrator who is qualified and experienced in that area some will do both some will do one or the other so you choose who you want to have and it's less hassle because you can set up the time, especially now you can do it all online. You can choose when it's gonna happen. You're not being told by a court, which if you're both busy, international, uh, trying to work, that is really, really good. Um, so it's much more convenient. And of course it's gonna be so much quicker because you're not waiting for overloaded court systems to find a, find a space for you. But the most important thing is you're a st still in control of the process. So do look at, uh, uh, arbitration as an, a serious option and it can work um, some, instead of or I prefer it to be something as a backstop personally because I think if you can come to an agreement working with collaborative lawyers or mediators then that's going to serve you well in the future you don't really want to hand the whole thing over to somebody else to decide the whole lot because if you've got children you're going to you want to have a way of working together and you can always go back into the collaborative process or mediation later on if you've got maybe some children issues that have, have come up and you want a bit of help so let's get ready now for our shared story hello elizabeth or liz do you, which do you prefer either I'm fine. Yeah, good, <laughs> <Yeah>. good. <laughs> as long as it's one or the other. Thank yeah. you for joining us. And um, I'm very grateful you're going to give us a little bit of your time. And you're going to share your own experience and what you learnt from it. And you've taken that experience and you're currently writing a book, I believe. 
Yeah, so I've already got two, Finding Lily and the A to Z of Emotional Abuse. And this is was actually supposed to be an ebook that uh, was like a, a giveaway, but it's actually turned into something a little bit bigger than that. So um, it's three things you should never do, divorcing a narcissist is the title. Um, my biggest takeaway was that going into the divorce process, you actually need to be divorced emotionally. Um, that was something that I realized further into the process that um, was happening uh, as the process was going along. I wasn't as emotionally divorced as I thought it was. So I was easy to trigger. I was easy to, it was easy for me to react rather than respond. Um, and of course, if you're, if you're divorcing somebody who's emotionally abusive or higher up the narcissistic spectrum, that is what they want. They're looking um, for those reactions. They're looking for that proof. But also what they've done is they've already negotiated before you've even come into the into the, that, the arena. Uh, they've decided what you're worth to them. They've decided what they're going to pay out if, that's, if it's that way around. There's a split of assets or they, they, they know uh, to what limit they're going to, uh, to go to. Um, and that includes hiding assets and uh, etc. So, and this is something that I experienced, and it was something that I totally regretted. And and I agreed to the um, the five uh, unreasonable behaviour just to get it through. And they said, "I'll pay for it you, if you agree to my terms." Uh, so I was like, "Well, what are the terms? I need to think about this." And it was like, "No, no, no! You have to make that decision." And I was sort of ended up being thrust down a route that um, I really, really regretted later. Um, and everyone's all for saving money, but I would actually say, I, you know, I wish I'd spent a little bit more in getting more fight, more support for myself. Yeah. Because you're, you know, you're, you're being bullied and obviously I see this a lot of bullied and bullied and and try mm. you just want it all to be over don't you so yeah. you don't want you don't want to pick a fight because you know no. from a bitter experience that that's not off that's that is also doesn't work so how how do you uh how do you where is that it's not even middle ground that alternative way of doing things because you've got um you don't lay down and die because they're just going to have a lovely time and completely take you for a ride if yeah. you go into full on battle, um, you, you they're gonna love that as well. So yeah. how how do you manage to do something? Do you have to just be smarter? How you how you divorce? Emotionally divorce. It is uh, emotionally divorce, or as much as you can emotionally divorce from them, is the way to 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 be because they will be looking to send those triggering emails or letters. Uh, they will be looking to poke as much as they can to get a re reaction because this is their stage, this is their arena. This is where they're getting, uh, with, the, with the narcissist or the emotional abuser, it's about supply, everything's about supply and the quality of supply. So the attention that they need and they feed on, this is where they're gaining it from. So there would be things like, so emotional, uh, divorcing emotionally, so that if they say anything, or you receive a letter from them, you're not reacting, you're responding calmly because they want that reaction. What I found was initially we went, we started on the, pro the process and I was being uh, pushed and pushed, give, we need this information, we need that information I supplied. And I was given a certain amount of time to sort out a solicitor and then I was given a date I needed to sort this out by and so in the end I didn't know what to do rabbits in you know rabbit in headlights and I just said no 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 don't worry I'm not going to get a solicitor um I'll do it all myself Blimey. and then there was tumbleweed nothing yeah and then I chased it in February so this is up my my date was the 5th of January I was given I had to respond by in February it was over mid-February. I was like, can somebody tell me what's going on? And it's like, oh yeah, we haven't done anything yet. So it's getting you into those positions where you have to make a decision 
and you're not given that time and then they hold back the, the next one was um i needed to get all this information in and the process and then again tumbleweed and this was about two and a half months later i was like can somebody tell me what's going on oh yeah we haven't got the money yet to pay the court so we, so basically again, you 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 were doing everything you should but it, it, there's a game being played yes, and that which yes. is delay delay so, delay yeah yes so i was in a position I wasn't emotionally I wasn't in the position that I wanted to go down I wasn't ready for that route so I felt like I was I was uh ushered down that route and then once I got in there I couldn't get out so I, I did attempt it at one point and I said look if this isn't going to happen I'm giving you to the end of June you got to the 30th of June and nothing has happened by then I will submit my own petition and I will I will take and of course the uh, emotionally abusive or a high, people are higher up on that spectrum don't want anyone else to take control. Um, so it, 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 the, yeah, the, the money was found very quickly. Would and you? So would you? Would you say? Paid. Yeah. So because you because you start to put some boundaries down. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yeah. And would you yeah. say that? So if if there's a divorce situation in an ideal world, um, I always recommend that people are the what they petition because it. It, it's in many ways it does give you more a bit more leverage when the other person is to be blunt dicking about mm. which and mm. it's very difficult if they petition and then they start stalling it, yes. it actually makes things much much harder to keep things moving yes. along mm. yeah yeah um there were there were a few th times that happened and in fact I, I must be you know the the court process i know it's centralized but there was one judge but it doesn't it falls down in certain areas there was one judge that turned around and said um actually i don't like this i don't like the um consent of the order I, you know can you can you both write in and tell me the reasoning behind the order and the reasoning why there's no pension share and there was a, an and in the middle and it was a a long sentence so, um, of course, this didn't go down too well. Um, that's excellent. And... <laughs> that's excellent. Because, I mean, that is that, that's that's one of the real ben one of the many good things, not many, one of the good things about the current system for all its uh, issues is the judge is a bit like a backstop, aren't they? And they and the good ones will spot when it's just clearly not fair and not yes. right and something's been missed out so it's i'm really i bet you're glad that, <laughs> that they well, spotted it did, that one it, it didn't actually <laughs> this is where it falls down because it's centralized it then goes mm. back into somebody else's desk and then you're that they, they they highlight something else and it goes back and it lands on somebody else's mm. desk so actually we were forced to go into court by the uh the system um mm. by the court pro by the divorce process they wanted it to be seen in court um and the barrister representing uh my ex was very good she was absolutely amazing um and she said look if this had landed you know she just wiped the floor with the whole process and i ha wasn't represented i had uh, somebody with me like a mackenzie friend who wasn't able didn't have that i uh, didn't have the benefit of somebody to counteract that and think quickly and understand the process because i did sit there thinking i have no idea what they're talking about she's mm. talking to the judge the judge knows what she's talking about and she knows what the judge is talking about and i'm just sat here and the judge i saw two judges uh the first one i can't remember what she specialized in but it wasn't divorce and the second mm -hmm. one uh was um she he specialized in um I think it was injuries or something like that. So nobody. It, that, you made such a good point there because again, yeah. like I was saying earlier, I with that arbitration. Yeah. Interview. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was, saw that. I listened to that interview and I thought I, I completely relate to that because they have no idea. Yeah. Because hmm. with the uh, at least with arbitrate, if you go for an arbitrate, if you if you can persuade the other person mm. if they if they really really mm. feel that they're right they may if you're lucky assume that the arbitrators yeah. will obviously see how it should be at least you can get someone who's who's highly competent in that area which does does help but you just don't know yeah, what you're going to totally. get in the family no. court that must be no. very stressful having to go through all that how when you talk about uh, just before we finish and thank you so much for sharing this i love no, hearing no, no. even i know it's been horrific for you but it's it's just important for people to to know that they're not the only ones who go through all of this when yeah. you talk about the um, emotional just uh, 
disconnection, the ability to um, divorce. To divorce emotionally. Yeah, can you just explain a li- just to round off a little bit what that actually means in in practice? Okay. So it um, so I work. This is this is my area because it was horrific and it was something. I actually heard I heard this term and I thought, oh, that's just an amazing summary. Divorcing emotionally means that if somebody says something to you, you get no reaction whatsoever. If they do something to you, they get no, you, you gives you no reaction. There's no trigger. So the trigger is that emotional reaction or, or a feeling within your body. So to divorce emotionally is to have all of those wounds coming out of an emotionally abusive relationship the biggest thing that you've got is trauma bonds the trauma bond that keeps you trapped that kept you trapped that hid the abuse that you didn't see everyone else could see it's going on you can't see it everyone's trying to tell you you can't see it and and they keep you trapped in that in that drama until there's nothing left and they can walk away and they leave you and that is the trauma bond held in place so by divorcing emotionally and i'm not talking about a bit of paper you know a divorcing um a divorcing emotionally is for anyone married or not it's it's not having a trigger you can hear their name and it doesn't make you cringe or or mm. squeeze up inside um and what is, and what processes did you use to to do that because that's a massive change to go through it is and it isn't something that happens overnight um i work with it's the wounding that i work with the that the wounds that so you've got various different things going on you've got a chemical reaction which is mainly oxytocin which is the bonding hormone but you've got both dopamine going on as well which was the reward center so they told you something it get you 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 were looking for your reward all the time from them um, but it was the oxytocin that bonded you into that relationship. And, and it's about, so I help people work through um, releasing those, the, the needs, that craving for that drug. So your drug of choice actually is the emotional abuser. And um, you're looking for that hit all the time. So it's helping people deal with that. Um, helping people come out of their head and into their body so that they can actually feel where the trauma is. So when you're reacting rather than responding, you're reacting from your monkey brain, from your uh, the, the, the part of you that is still in the, it's the stress hormones, the stresses are still there triggering you. So it's helping people calm the body down. And then once you've calmed it down, uh, you can then start looking for the wounds and the emotional wounds that were are held within the body. So, but yeah, Brilliant. that's, so deep, that, that's quite deep healing. So that's t- really become is, your yeah. life now. You've moved into that. Yeah. Is that right? It's like, yeah. For... It's like a friend of mine told me the other day about something, uh, and I'd, I'd sent her a link to a body language expert, and it was like, and she was like, wanted to talk about it. I was like, oh, this is my favourite subject. It isn't my favourite subject because I know it's so painful and I know how hard it is yeah. to come out of it. But mm. it is, I'm so passionate about it. I'm now working with um, a sanctuary um, for abused women and mm-hmm. this is the area that I am, you know, I'm sort of doing this, I want to go down the support route, but I really want to go down the court route. So uh, mm. supporting people going to court and i'm yeah. trying to change it from women because i know the sanctuary that i will be working with is women but i this year i have been shocked at the amount of men that yeah. have reached out to me really, I've, I've, many, really many 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 men who it, yeah. it's just it's it's it, it goes across all all sexes yes. definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. well I, I, I love i love someone who's when they're on a good mission and it's a very powerful <laughs> one so thank you so much for sharing your story i really appreciate Absolutely. it and make sure you put links to information i'll send you links to where yes. this goes out and if you could add it to the comments yes, that would be wonderful course. yeah speak to you again so soon bye bye liz so tough stuff uh, both men and women go through this all the time but it's great to s- I just love it when people take their trauma and, and heal themselves and then look to heal others as well so we're going to uh, have a very quick whiz through the workshops and then we are going to do some healing ourselves with uh, the lovely Susan Cowmiller so another reminder of the online workshop uh, the um, collaborative lawyer 
who is and she's a normal family lawyer as well Lorraine Toll who we saw in the video earlier she will be one of the many experts at this workshop uh, be assured if you register for this you don't have to wait to the 21st of January if, January if you do need some support and help in advance uh, we won't make you wait but the, the workshop will be fantastic for you whether you're early stages checking it out right in the middle of it or even coming out the other end but knowing that things aren't you know you don't want things to keep dragging on so now we're going to prepare ourselves for our live healing with susan Welcome, Susan. Have we got sound? Have we got sound? I hope so. Yes, yes. we have. It's Yay. all working, working extremely well today. Um, I better not speak too soon. So what are you going to be doing with us today? It's interesting just talking about you. I'm sure your ears are burning from all that trauma because I know you help people from um, who are in all kinds of, of have had physical trauma held in their bodies, which as all trauma is. I know that's a large part of the work that you do. It was very interesting. I was quite engrossed in it, actually. It was lovely to hear. It was very interesting. And would you agree that, um, I'm, I'm not saying that the healing we're going to do now is going to remove people's trauma, but actually tapping into these kinds of healing is a really important part of, of releasing trauma and moving through that. Well, trauma gets blocked in the body and there are various routes that one can take to release it. I work with a particular one and it's essential for our all-round health that we don't hold on to these, these things that don't serve. And so what are you going to be doing with us uh, today before I put you on the big um, slide with the nice music in the background? I'm doing... A a short EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique Tapping Session with a related re-imprinting stroke visualisation. Lovely calming session. Excellent. Thank you, Saul. Well, let's move on and uh, thank you for that and I'll move us into it. So off you go. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone and we're sharing tonight a simple and powerful healing using EFT, the tapping points on energy channels of the body and re-imprinting which offers a message into the powerful subconscious to take on a new expectation. I'll ask you to repeat each phrase in a moment while we tap along. And you will sense a change in energy when we move from stating the negative phrases and begin to state the positive and healing phrases. Just repeat, follow what I'm saying. No pressure in getting the tapping points pinpoint specific and allow the process to flow and enjoy the experience. We're going to tap very gently on the karate point with the fingertips and we're going to repeat a phrase. Even though life is fairly challenging these days, I love and accept myself more and more each day. So just repeat the phrase when I have a slight pause. Even though life is fairly challenging these days, and it's soon Christmas, I love and accept myself more and more each day. So let's move and we'll start with the tapping point at the top of the head. And repeat, I feel challenged most days. Corner of the eye, feeling challenged. These challenges can wear me out. Feeling challenged. 
Now, I've got a question for you. When I'm saying this about feeling challenged, perhaps you can feel it in your body. Just be aware where you might be feeling a sensation in your body when you're repeating this. Now we're going to under the nose point. A lot of challenges these days for me. Feeling challenged and stressed. Collarbone point. I feel these challenges. Where do you feel these challenges when you feel stress and challenge? Where do you feel them in your body? I feel them. Where do you feel them? I've got a pussy cat. He's nice <laughs> helping me to relax. We're doing the positive rounds next. Top of the head. I choose to release this feeling of stress. Letting it go. Releasing the challenging feelings. Releasing the stresses. Allowing myself to feel much more at ease. Feeling much more at ease. Collarbone, lovely point on the collarbone. Feeling relaxed. Feeling relaxed and ready for a little visualization, a little re-imprinting. I invite you to close your eyes. You don't have to, but close your eyes and instinctively use your senses and bring in a sense of peace into your head, into the head space, this sense of peace. All the neurons in the head, inside the brain, are taking this in this sense of feeling much more at peace and at ease. I'm asking you to choose a colour and infuse this colour into your sense of peace. Make the colour much bigger and stronger. Take yourself to your place of peace to where you feel safe and loved and bring in sounds that you might expect to hear or want to hear or have music playing in the background. You want to make this message as big and strong as you can. You want to empower your sense of peace. You want to empower your ability for calm Allow this picture, your favourite place, surrounded by a beautiful, strong colour that you chose, and allow this to float into all the cells of your body. Take it down your neck, across your shoulders, down your arms, into the tips of your fingers. Bring it back, open your Open your lung space, breathe in this beautiful picture with all the senses taking it in. Open your heart space, allow it then to move down all the soft tissue into your hips and thighs, into your knees. Your knees are the first part of your body which take you forward. Move forward with this beautiful sensation in your knees, down your calves, feet and down into Mother Earth. And take this as far down as it can go, growing roots and fibres. This picture, this picture of peace. Then bring it back up, all the way through your body. And then when it gets back into your head, I want you to ping it out. Ping it out into the universe as far as it'll go, and then even further. A sense of peace and bring it back in folds to you. Bring it back 
into your body. Sit with it. Breathe with it. Breathe in the power, the opportunity for peace, calm and healing. Savour it. And in a moment or two, gently open your eyes. You deserve to feel peace and calm. You deserve. Deep breath in and out. Thank you, Susie. That's us for tonight. And please use the links that Susie will give you later if you wish to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And um, I won't be giving links. You are. You're going to be posting them. Actually, I probably will put them on for you as well. But uh, but you you there be, might be particular things that you want to share. So just add them into the comments. And of course, anyone watching this again, you'll there'll be in that. There's a nice QR code you will have noticed next to Susan that takes you to a good place. So definitely check that out. We come to the end, and here we are. And the fact is that in the war of divorce. On the battlefield of family separation, always, always make peace your weapon of choice.